1970, the University of Melbourne established Australia's first Department of Otolaryngology, appointing Professor Graham Clark as its inaugural chair. The research undertaken by Professor Clark and his multidisciplinary team led to the development of his breakthrough bionic ear, the multi-channel cochlear implant enabling truly meaningful sound for deaf people around the world. Professor Graham Clark and Professor Richard Dahl have joined us today to share their insights into this important achievement. Professor Clark, can you please first give us some background on this pioneering surgical research? Scientists' quest to enable hearing has inspired many major contributions over the years, in fact, for centuries. In our own case, it took many years of research and experiments understanding the brain and how it processes sound, developing the surgical techniques, even the tools, finding a pathway between hearing basic noise and understanding intricate sound, such as speech. All this resulted in our successful multi-channel cochlear implant in August 1978 at Melbourne's Eye and Ear Hospital with our first patient, Rod Saunders. When did you become deaf? Where do I live? No. When? 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 There was so much material. There was so much material. Wrapped around his head. Wrapped around his head. He could hardly keep his balance. He'd hardly keep his balance. Our array of uh, electrodes that had multiple channels enabled us to engineer a sophisticated processing of the speech signal. It sounded like off, low and down. That's a very high F and sharp. The speech code that was discovered enabled profoundly deaf adults to understand running speech both with and without lip reading. Bale. Bale. Male. Male. Good. Now, just the time. We're going to go there. I'm the Raw. Raw. Good. What is the pitch? What is the pitch? Good. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Good. Since that first breakthrough, we've continued to develop the technology and I am proud that it has inspired further developments from our own and other scientists and researchers around the world. We've seen some enormous advances over the years, as Richard well knows. Yes, that's right, Graham. The initial speech coding strategy and the refinements we've made gave us a far greater understanding of how to manage the sound signals so they could be understood. It's a rather simple way to look at this uh, process, but think of tuning a radio and you can have an ugly squawk and basically messy noise if you're off the station or you can adjust the controls and fine-tune it so you get the best available sound. That's the type of thing we've been involved in over about 20 years in improving the cochlear implant. Right back there in the 80s we quickly realised that the, the clinical and educational management of people with multi-channel cochlear implants was an essential part for its success. This work all began at the Royal Victorian Eye and Ear Hospital in Melbourne, the first public-based hospital clinic of its type in the world. Our research then led to the industrial development by Cochlear Limited and it was trialled in 1982 on six patients. The first was on Graham Carrick in September that year. <laughs> I'm getting a strange reaction. Fantastic. What did it sound like? It was something like a shock, yeah? It was fantastic. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It went boom! Oh, great. Like a horn! 
Yes. That's what I heard. The good results we obtained on these patients led to an international trial, especially in the US, and in 1985 the Australian product became the first multi-channel cochlear implant to be approved by the US Food and Drug Administration. Professor Dale, you were part of the team that led the approach. Just how important was it to get the approval? Well, it was extremely important, especially commercially, to get that approval from the FDA because it meant that the re research at the University of Melbourne could get out there into the world. And it set the standard for the rest of the developers around the world to follow. I imagine that approval would not have come easily. Uh, no, it wasn't easy. We were working in the dark. It was something I'd certainly never done before. And we were trying to create the, uh, the approval process as we went along. I think the FDA were as well because they hadn't done it before. But we had no room for failure and we were dealing with lots of different clinics and hospitals and surgeons and we had to bring that all together. And luckily we got there. Yes, it was certainly a major achievement. The FDA approval was a statement of confidence in all our research, the technology, the surgery, and the device itself. And that initial approval led to our refining the product for use in profoundly deaf children. It was evaluated on our first child in 1985 and our first young child in 1986. <laughs> That's my father. That's my father. I went to see Crocodile Dundee 2. Good, okay. The results of our trials were published in 87 in four international journals and we had presentations in 87 and 88 at major conferences. This also led to an international study trial for the US Food and Drug Administration and in 1990 we were delighted to hear that the Australian product became the first cochlear implant of any sort to be approved by the FDA for use in young children. This represents the first major advance anywhere in the world in probably 250 years for helping deaf children to communicate. All previous studies had been on implants for one year. So in 1989, our team at the University of Melbourne began studies on people having cochlear implants in both ears to see if it would benefit sound localization and hearing and noise. Today, bilateral implants are very common for people diagnosed as profoundly deaf. Professor Clark and Professor Dow, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.